Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Uh, we are just still admitting a few other folks, and we will get started shortly. Standard, standard starts, standard Zoom start time for a big meeting is, I hear, is three minutes after the start date, so, or the start time. And then it ends up being like the longest minute ever between 102 and 103. Very, very long minute. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So hi everyone. I'm can see some of your faces. Uh, I'm Leslie Rogers. I'm a toaster with our behavioral, our district behavioral health and wellness department, specifically around safety and wellness. And I'm so excited that we have uh, Naomi Hunziker and Andy Cartmill from Washington County here with us uh, to talk about uh, fentanyl and other opioids. Um, as many of you have heard, we've had a rash of deaths in our in our student community um, in a little bit more than a year, so much more than we've ever had in the years that I've been in my position. So um, I'm just so so pleased that you chose to be here. I know that this is your own time and I know that it's a really stressful time. So thank you for, for coming and I will go ahead and turn it over to uh, Naomi and Andy to introduce themselves. Great, thank you, Leslie. Uh, as she said, my name is Naomi Hunsaker. I am with Washington County Behavioral Health in the Addictions Program. Happy to be here and I'll pass it off to Andy here. Thank you, Naomi. And I, my name is Andy Cartmill, and I'm an educator with Washington County Addiction Services. Um, spend a lot of time out in the community uh, talking to people about substance use, gambling disorders, and things like that, with the whole idea of not having the process begin. Um, so uh, thank you again so much for being here. Um, as I say, just about every time I have the opportunity to talk to individuals, uh, we would much, much rather be there and looking you in the eye, walking around the room and, and doing that, but we can't right now. So we really appreciate the opportunity to be able to come and do this. So uh, a pleasure to be here and um, we're going to go ahead and, and get started. This is what we're going to talk about today. We are going to talk about the uh, opioid epidemic. You know, we use that term epidemic a lot, and especially in the last year or so, epidemic and pandemic. Um, but um, as Leslie said, there's, uh, there's been an increase in overdoses, in deaths that are having, that are related to opioid use. And uh, so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're also going to talk about a couple of other substance related data and trends. Uh, but we are going to go over the data and trends and give you the latest of what we have to forward on to you just to give you knowledge to, in, in this subject. We are going to talk particularly about fentanyl, um, which is a synthetic opioid. We'll, we'll talk about all this stuff. We're going to talk about overdose and we're going to talk about the treatment for overdose, naloxone or Narcan. And, um, we're going to mention a little bit about that gorgeous, beautiful developing brain and the role it plays when we're talking about substance use disorders and that significance of trauma um, and risk factors and protective factors. And what a difference that um, increasing those protective factors and minimizing those risk factors make in a, in a person's life. Going to mention uh, resilience, talk about that a little bit, talk about community education, resources, and then we're going to be done. Feel free to put questions in the chat throughout this presentation. Um, and then I think since we have a pretty big crowd here, which I'm really happy to see, uh, if, if we will have time at the end, um, if you want to unmute and ask questions and um, we, we can go that route. But it, it, in the meantime, if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat and one of us should be able to get to it uh, more in real time. So 
thank you for being here again. And let's talk about opioids. As a matter of fact, when I use the term opioids, when we say opiates and opioids and narcotics and things like that, you know, one thing we've learned that even though we're in an epidemic and, you know, we, we talk about the pandemic with, with COVID, we all kind of know what COVID is. We know it's a virus. We even know what that little sucker looks like, right? But we, we toss these terms about, but one thing we have learned is that a lot of individuals, a lot of people really don't know what opioids are. And so let me start from the basics. When, when I use the term opiate, what I'm referring to is um, drugs or substances that are naturally derived from that poppy plant. So when I say opiate, I am talking about things like opium, um, morphine, codeine. When I say opioids, Opioids are synthetic or semi-synthetic. So heroin, for example, is made from morphine. So that is considered an opioid. Um, uh, hydrocodone, Vicodin, uh, oxycodone, oxycontin. And as I mentioned, heroin. Heroin can come in many forms. Heroin can come in a white powder form. Heroin can come in a brown powder form. Heroin can come in black tar form, like you see in the upper right there. But what these all do is they are analgesic in nature, um, but they do other things. For example, um, maybe in your lifetime, you have taken uh, or been prescribed codeine for a cough. Codeine for a cough. That's not analgesic, is it? These, these substances um, seriously have done wonders for us. They've, they've, they don't take the pain away, they change our perception of pain. It's very interesting. Codeine works in the, the medulla oblongata in our brainstem, that's our cough center. And what it does, it, it, it binds with opioid receptors there and it, it reduces the severity of coughs. It's very effective. Dextromethorphan does the same thing, which is another substance that can be abused. It binds to opioid receptors, but that's available over the counter in things like Robitussin. We're a drug using people and we do use drugs in this country from birth to death. This is a reality that we face. And I've mentioned this before, if you've ever heard me talk about substance use and things, for, for us to come in and say, don't do drugs, it really doesn't resonate because you'll go home and watch 50, 60, 70 commercials telling you to do to use drugs. We are a substance using people and we don't like feeling bad. When we're talking about opioids, when, when we consider the United States, uh, Canada, Western Europe, we consume about 95% of the world's opioids. We don't like feeling bad here. And that is just a reality that we got to deal with. But again, with all that, a lot of people don't know what opioids are. So everybody thinks of heroin and heroin doesn't just have to be injected. Heroin can be snorted, it can be smoked. When we talk about fentanyl, that, that can be uh, transdermal, it can be put in a skin patch. It can be in a lozenge form. So let me ask you this. I'm gonna ask you a poll question, if you don't mind. What do you think? Have you ever been prescribed an opioid well, I shouldn't say ever, within the last five years. And remember, that includes things like codeine, which a lot of people don't consider an opiate or an opioid. I love talking to school districts. <laughs> You're all like responding. <laughs> this is awesome. I'll give you about 10 more seconds or so. I'll 
I'll give you 10 more because I want to tell you one more little fact. According to the Oregon Health Authority, when we talk about opioid and opiate overdose and the number of deaths from prescription drug overdoses from 2005 to 2017, you guys, we've seen a 450% increase. Naomi's going to talk a lot about this. And we've seen a 450% increase. About 60, a little over 60% of you have been prescribed an opioid. Okay. We all share in this. Okay. So I'm going to turn this over to Naomi to do what she does. And um, Naomi, you set? Yes, thanks, Andy. Could you change to the next slide, please? All right, so we're talking about prescriptions um, and talking about prescriptions is really important because this really is how the opioid epidemic began. Um, there is a direct correlation between the amount of drugs that have been sold and also the number of deaths that happen in a community. And in fact, Oregon had the highest rate of prescription misuse in the entire country. Enough prescriptions for every individual in Washington County that was prescribed to have at least three prescriptions each. That also being noted, a fourth of the people in Washington County who had prescriptions were under the age of 35. And so when we're talking about our youth, really just keeping that in mind, you know, this is kids who have had wisdom teeth taken out. These are kids who have experienced sports injuries. And even two years ago, 35% of juniors still said that prescriptions were easy to get. I put up here kind of an overview of the epidemic. It's really been broken down into three waves. And the first one was starting around 2000. And that's really where doctors were prescribing a lot of opioids. At that time, doctors did not know the harms. They did not know that it was addictive. They did not know that it led to fatal or non-fatal overdoses. Uh, they really just didn't want their patients to be in pain. And so because of that, uh, these became very commonly prescribed. They were very available in communities. They were socially acceptable, legal, and, and given out from somebody that they trust. Now you can see that light blue line there of how it started to increase from that time all the way to about 2010. And at that time is really where we talk about wave two, which was the rise of heroin. Now, some of the great things that happened in the first wave was that doctors really got educated. They were given information about the harms that happened. Monitoring systems got put in place by uh, community public health programs, really trying to make sure that not only the number of prescriptions decreased, but the amounts in each prescription decreased as well. And they were actually really successful. The problem is, is people already were becoming to be very addicted. Um, people were really struggling and doctors essentially had cut off their clients from those prescriptions. This really pushed the community then to seek out other things to help with their pain, to help with their addiction. And at that time, heroin was very cheap and it was really available. So then we move into the third wa wave there, the rise of synthetic or uh, fentanyl opioids. Um, and you can see how dramatic the purple line really increases. Um, part of this is heroin and fentanyl are much more potent. They can cause death faster. The ways they are used could cause death faster as well. And, um, and we, we mostly saw this spike to this level on the East Coast. They were hit really hard. Just to give you an idea of the potency of fentanyl, if you had the weight of a mosquito, that is all it takes to cause a death. Now fentanyl uh, really started getting into the drug supply because it takes so little. So you could put it in anything and somebody could have um, a high or a reaction to that substance. Next slide, please. So I wanna take this a little closer to home. We do a lot of tracking in the Tri-County area with Clackamas, Multnomah and Washington County. And back in 2018, uh, just to give you an idea of who was being affected with fatalities here, was that three people a week died of opioid overdoses. I see a question here about synthetic. So synthetic is um, 
uh, things like uh, fentanyl. So yes, things not typically coming directly from the poppy plant itself, uh, more chemically breaking down. So heroin and fentanyl also, they had increased significantly three times from 2016 to 2018. So we did see that uh, increase as well here. We also saw that on, on average, it was about 12 people who were dying from fentanyl in the Tri-County area in that year. I do want to note, though, again, that death is just the beginning. Um, there also is hospitalizations, urgent care visits, um, going to the emergency department, our ambulance services, and they really respond to non-fatal overdoses. And so that also is something that we're tracking on a weekly basis. And for the Tri-County area, we see about 23 overdose uh, responses a week, and that's five for Washington County. For our uh, Metro West partners, our ambulance services, we see on average 11 overdoses a week, which is three for Washington County. Next slide, please. So we know that COVID has impacted all of our lives and following 2018, that's where COVID comes into the picture. We know that COVID has impacted certain communities much higher than other ones as well. And unfortunately, those who use substances is one of those communities. We saw that um, in some early studies, uh, could we go back just one slide there, Andy? Or two slides, it looks like. Sorry, nothing is responding and it kind of jumped forward without, I didn't do anything. <laughs> oh, uh-oh. Uh, give me just a sec here. Sure. Well, during COVID, um, some of the things to note is there were some early studies showing that people who use substances were actually being more impacted. They were um, really getting COVID at a higher rate than the general population, which was really concerning to us. Um, that's actually one of the reasons why the eligibility for the vaccine, for example, was bumped up for those populations. Um, we also saw that during the early parts of COVID-19 that we were seeing an increase in how many people were dying from uh, overdoses. And can you go back one more, Andy? Thank you. So over a 12 month period of time from April of 2019 to 2020, we actually saw that that was the highest 12 month period of time where we ever had seen any overdose deaths. Um, that was a 70% increase, and this is just for the state of Oregon, uh, between April of 2019 to 2020. And if you look at this, I mean, fentanyl alone had increased by 92%. So these are massive increases. Now we think about our youth, right? And, and we can kind of guess some of the things that really had impacted this. We know that these rates really were directly correlated with the pandemic disruptions. We think about um, kids who might have been in treatment for substance use disorders being, you know, having those, those treatments uh, disrupted, having maybe medication assisted treatment not be available, support systems greatly decreased. We know that our kids, you know, they miss their friends. They saw parents go through economic struggles, maybe job loss. And I think really importantly when we talk about resiliency, but also people in recovery, is that coping mechanisms that we had used before just weren't available. We also are kind of keeping in mind trauma. We know trauma is directly correlated with later substance use disorders, especially injectable drug use. And so we are concerned about how trauma through COVID-19 may later impact um, kids in this area. The CDC had put out an advisory. Um, actually, the Tri-County had also put out an advisory around March when we saw these increases to public health departments and our partners. Um, we saw through the CDC that they really noted that fentanyl and stimulants such as methamphetamine were really hitting hard on the West Coast. Um, and so that was one thing where we had really wanted to put together some prevention messaging, some monitoring to see what is happening on a, a closer basis. Next slide, please. So uh, fentanyl, again, uh, Andy gave a little bit of a description about opioids overall, um, but it's a synthetic opioid. Um, and this is one across the United States that is most commonly involved with drug deaths. Um, it has been prescribed for pain, but now is really made illegally uh, on the street. It's 50 to 100 times more potent um, than morphine. And so again, this is incredibly strong. 
And if you had a shoebox full of fentanyl, it would be enough to poison our entire state. Now we've talked with our, um, our interagency narcotics team, which really kind of follow trafficking, um, how many pills are coming into our community as well as overdose deaths. And one of the concerns that we have is that there's been such an increase that last year, for example, they had three opioid related overdose and this can be actually fatal or non-fatal. Um, and then this year, unfortunately, they've seen 14, 10 of those which are suspected to be fentanyl directly related. And one of the concerns with fentanyl, um, unfortunately, is that it's very dangerous because people just don't know that it's there. It takes so little um, and it kind of takes people by surprise to know that it is in so many different things. Next slide, please. So we have another poll question for you. What percentage of substances seized by law enforcement are counterfeit? So it's the last few people wondering, I don't know if I want to commit. <laughs> yeah, I'll give it about 10 more seconds. Wonderful. So it looks like the um, most popular answer here is nearly 70%, uh, second to 85%. and looks like it's almost a tie with 50% and 100%. You know, it actually is virtually 100%. Um, it's really shocking. It seems like that's the answer, you know, on any Scantron test that you don't want to pick because it just seems too definite. Um, but unfortunately, our, our labs tell us that everything that they're bringing in is not what it says it is, which is quite concerning. Wow. Next slide, please. So unfortunately, uh, one of the things that we really have wanted to share with the community is that oftentimes, you know, these are pills, uh, they seem less concerning because they're pills, and they're advertised as being legitimate prescriptions, um, but they are almost always counterfeit. There's always that percent room for maybe a possibility, but everything that is being tested comes back is not what it says it is. One of the hard things is, is that, you know, pill presses used to be um, not as um, well made, I guess, as they used to be, or as they are now. And it's really hard to tell the difference. You know, it used to be that you could kind of see that a pill looked sort of crumbly um, or, or not quite as polished, but now it's virtually impossible to tell the difference, even from experienced users. Uh, they look like what they're being sold as, or there's very mild differences. And we think about our youth, right? And, and they probably don't know what it's supposed to be looking like unless they've used that substance before. And then if everything is counterfeit, of course, they're comparing it to something that's counterfeit. Another thing that we're concerned about here is that um, younger people are acquiring and selling large amounts of counterfeit pills. Part of this is, you know, during COVID, we saw that the typical distribution methods um, changed to more youth specific distribution methods. Just being in this um, virtual environment, um, things like uh, social media or even mail orders became the commonality for adults and youth, which then means that youth have more access to these pills. You know, it's simple as ordering it over online, right? Um, and another thing is, you know, we think about there being this drug dealer online who they don't know, um, and, and this is how youth are getting them, but that's not really the truth. Youth oftentimes are getting it through a friend who knows someone else. These are trusting relationships that get built up. So they really don't think that these, these are pills that could harm them, unfortunately. We also are seeing that youth are more involved just in the process of distributing itself. They're, they're getting pill presses online and making their own pills. Um, it's much easier to do now. Um, one of the things that really surprises our partners through law enforcement and uh, the interagency narcotics team that we work with here in Washington County is that 
you know, it's just become this very casual nature. Pills just don't seem to be a concern. Um, the perception is, is that they're not even illegal sometimes. Um, and it's very socially acceptable to take, you know, in, any pills that are offered. Um, also a challenge with pills is that they're easy to hide. Um, you know, alcohol, uh, marijuana, you know, there's a scent to it. Um, it's larger, right? Uh, but with pills, you can put it almost anywhere. There's not really that odor, bottles or other things that you can look for. Now, I do wanna note too, that as much as we're talking about these concerns, um, this is information we're giving to you as uh, staff, teachers, you know, administration, uh, people who, you know, really are caring about our youth. Um, but I also wanna note, you know, these messages, as much as they are really 100% true, um, they're different messages than we use with our youth. And we really wanna bring that out because unfortunately the research shows us that the more education about substances, um, the more um, information on access to substances and even the fatality of substance actually increases youth likelihood to want to use it. Um, it's seen as more pure um, or the better drug. And so it's very different from the way that we talk with adults about these risks because unfortunately it can have the opposite effect. Next slide, please. Hey, Naomi, we have a, a handful of questions. Sure. I just wanted, I don't know if we pointed out that we can wait till the end or if you want me to interject and let you know. Sure. Um, I can pull up the chat here and see if there's some that I can um, respond to. I think that what I see, one of the biggest ones, I, well, I saw that uh, somebody asked for a picture of a, pro, a pill press, uh, but also said the question about what it is, um, I'll let you see. Are the synthetic drugs laced with fentanyl using large amount of fentanyl or is it the fact that it's mixed with other opioids that makes it so deadly? And then before that was a question about essentially uh, really the same thing. Why would they add fentanyl um, mm -hmm. if that's killing people? Because that would essentially right. kill a business if that was what they were trying to do is make money. Yeah, those are really uh, great questions. I don't have a, a picture actually of a pill press here, um, but honestly, if you wanna do an online search, I always put the note, maybe not on your work computer, um, but if you look up a pill press you very quickly, you can see on Amazon, you can buy them and have it sent to your door. So they're very easy to find, they're very accessible. Um, uh, so that would be my suggestion uh, around the pill press. Um, the mixing, uh, well, I guess going to the, the fentanyl, why are they adding it if it kills you, right? Um, that's a really great point. And I think that was a question that came up a lot when fentanyl came you know, to our state, for example. Um, but the thing is, is that if you mix a tiny bit in with you know, any substance that could be a binder, sometimes it is with other substances, which was the question there as well. Um, but it really just makes the, um, the high or the reaction um, that somebody is looking for there without having to have a whole lot of product. So the reason why they're adding it is because they can put a tiny bit in um, and then they can have somebody have that, um, that reaction and they don't have to create so much of the drug. So it's really about cost effectiveness with um, the amount. It's really just, there's not this great measuring tool. You know, this isn't really um, put together in a very, maybe educated process. Um, they're just hoping that it's not too much, um, but unfortunately so little is dangerous that it's hard to know. Um, regarding the mixing, we're gonna get to some of that. So if I don't answer that, please bring up that question again, or Leslie, if you can help make sure I can circle back, but I'll put that one on pause just for a moment, if that's all right. Yep, sounds, sounds good. Perfect. And everybody else, like I, I will interject some, uh, but there will be a, a chunk of time at the end to, uh, to go through and make sure that questions get answered. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Leslie. So, um, you know, in bringing this information to you, we really just wanted you to know what was going on, what the trends are looking like in our community, what we're concerned about, um, why this is really impacting our youth, um, but also thinking about, you know, as um, teachers that meet with kids, you know, we want you to know what overdose looks like. Um, there have been overdoses at school, um, hopefully most non-fatal, um, and we want you to know how to respond. Um, many schools now we see are putting together some phenomenal policies um, really to support teachers, so I definitely would recommend asking your administration about um, what resources you have available. And I do realize too, this is a lot more complicated when you're doing um, online learning, so um, that can be challenging too. One of the main things I wanna share about overdose is that, you know, I think TV and movies have really done a disservice here. Um, they make it look really dramatic and it isn't necessarily very dramatic at all. 
Um, these are signs of heroin um, overdose, but this really is any opioid overdose. Um, and as you can see, many of these things could easily be um, mistaken for something else, you know, feeling sleepy, um, you know, uh, maybe just kind of feeling sort of weak or less responsive. Um, but what we're really looking for is people who are really disoriented. Um, you're really not able to awake them. Um, or they're making really strange sounds like these gurgling, large uh, snoring noises. Um, you can really see that almost it looks like their chest is having a hard time breathing. And then of course, if it's the bluish lips or fingernails, that's a really good point as well. Um, this can also happen from a few minutes to hours. You know, it's not necessarily that it's gonna be instantaneous. Um, with fentanyl or carfentanil, it's actually even more potent. Um, it is more likely to happen quicker. But also it doesn't mean necessarily that they're just gonna completely um, lose consciousness, which is also kind of a myth out there. Essentially an overdose really is just that your breathing is slowing and then it could also stop. Um, as opioids attach with the receptor in your brain, it decreases the amount of oxygen that reaches your brain. And that's what leads to either the brain damage or the overdose or death. Um, Keeping in mind that if you know we have younger users or people who are not as familiar with using opioids, this can happen a lot faster. Um, but then also, you know, the typical person that we might think is at risk may be a little bit different here too. One of the things around youth that I think about is is actually people who have been in recovery. So if you have somebody who's been to treatment um, and they're out of treatment now. Um, that's actually one of the riskiest signs, um, somebody who may be newly not using um, or could be triggered again. Um, also, I think about this age, right? There's this amazing thing about youth where they are very confident. Um, and in many things, that's great. It allows us to take risks. Um, it really allows um, youth to grow and thrive. Um, but here, unfortunately, there is this sense that can happen that, oh, I know what's in this. I've done this before. Um, uh, or everything's going to be fine, right? And, and unfortunately, that is a great risk, talking about opioids and overdose as well. And then finally, if, if people have family members or friends who use substances, that is another concern um, about likelihood to possibly have an overdose as well. Next slide, please. So I want to bring your attention to naloxone. Um, Andy had already mentioned this briefly. Um, but naloxone is a really wonderful resource. And I just want you to know kind of what it looks like, how it's available, um, because this is a life-saving medication. It's been around actually for a long time. Um, law enforcement, paramedics, they've been using it for decades and it is incredibly safe and it is very effective. Now, like I said, um, opioids really are causing breathing to slow and stop. So you can actually revive somebody just with CPR alone, which is fantastic. But there is a level where potency could be so great that that's really hard to do. And that's why this was developed. It really is to kick off the opioid from the receptor and help people breathe again. Now there's several different kinds. There's injectable, there's nasal, there's um, also this auto injector that you see on the top right. Um, and then what our county typically uses most is Narcan, which is in the left, which essentially is like a, a nasal spray. Um, if you've used, you know, Afrin or some uh, uh, salt water spray before, it's essentially the same thing. Oftentimes they come in doses of two, which is really important because most overdoses in our county require at least two doses for a reversal to occur. Um, but I wanna bring up, there's a lot of concerns sometimes about naloxone. Um, it doesn't require a prescription um, outside of really just going to a pharmacy and they can give it to you. Um, it does fully reverse the opioid overdose. It doesn't give anybody a high, it's not addictive. Um, and actually, if somebody was overdosing and you gave it to them, it wouldn't, or sorry, if they weren't overdosing, but for example, maybe you misread the signs um, that thinking they were overdosing and you gave this to them, it wouldn't actually cause them any harm. This has been used on infants. It's been used on pregnant women um, and definitely our youth. So it is very safe. Um, in addition to that, um, uh, you may wonder where you can have access to this uh, and I know some schools we've talked about, you know, will this be available in nurses' offices? Um, I'm not sure about the current policy in your school, but I definitely recommend you ask. Um, but if people are wanting to get a hold of this, definitely if you call 911, um, they will have it on hand. So not only can they administer it to somebody who may be having an overdose, um, but also there are some people as well who can distribute to people who need it. 
We have a Washington County Public Health fan as well. It's actually in Hillsboro at the Dairy Creek Park. They also give this out for free. Um, and it could be in many different forms. So just kind of keeping that in mind. Um, if a youth is engaged in any kind of addiction treatment, they also can have it um, received for free. Our program actually pays for funding for addiction programs to have access to this. Uh, and then again, going to the pharmacy. It could be a copay, but if you have uh, OHP insurance or the client has OHP insurance, uh, they can actually get it at no cost. Next slide, please. All right, so there was a question about multiple substances and that's kind of what I wanted to talk about here. Um, I'm just kind of showing you the trends since 2009 to uh, 2019 here um, for our county. And the orange line is actually prescription um, opioid deaths and that's kind of gone down or stayed stable for the most part. Uh, we have this yellow line, which is heroin, which is increasing. Um, and then we have the green line. I know both of these green and yellow lines look like they dipped down, but actually in 2020, they're back on the same trajectory. So we are seeing this in increasing climb. Um, but as a tri-county, um, things have definitely shifted. And here we're seeing the shift as well. And that's really where I want to bring your attention to this darker green line, which is stimulants. This is things like methamphetamine and cocaine. Um, meth never left our community. Um, it really just softened and the opioid epidemic took over as a really key concern. Um, but unfortunately, meth is rising um, at a very fast rate. In the Tri-County area in 2018, it surpassed all opioid overdose deaths. Um, and so this is a concern that we really want to bring attention to. The other thing which was kind of noted before is that you know, polysubstance use is a norm. It's not the exception. Most people don't use one drug in isolation. And as we talked about before in counterfeit medication, oftentimes there's more than one drug in that anyway. So whether somebody is taking a drug and they know what it is, or if they're taking something that's an illicit substance, unfortunately, um, in both of those cases, it's more probable that they have more than one substance within it. And um, if you are mixing uh, benzodiazepine, which is like a muscle relaxer or things like Xanax, if you have uh, methamphetamine um, or even drinking alcohol, it increases significantly the fatality um, possibility of taking the substance. Um, just benzodiazep benzodiazepines alone uh, quadruple the risk of overdose death. And so um, this is something that we're really concerned about going forward. And next slide, please. So we have another question for you here, which is what percentage of juniors in 2018 reported that they don't use prescription medication? Give it about 10 more seconds. Man, I really appreciate the participation in the polling. This is very cool. Okay. Here's what you all said. Around 47%. It's a, it's a weird way to ask that question. What percentage of, of our juniors did not use prescription drugs that were not prescribed to them or misuse, however you want to phrase that? And the majority said 47%. Um, my gosh, about equal said either 60 or 82%. Very few said 96%. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the answer to this question is... 96%. I mentioned earlier that we are a drug using people and it is very true. And we've given you a lot of information on the dangers of, uh, of these substances and especially when they are misused and not taken as prescribed. Um, one of the messages I give to our youth and I, talk, I have the opportunity to talk to thousands of our youth, um, especially throughout Washington County 
is that when they tell me, dude, everybody's doing this, I, my answer to that is, dude, no, they're not. No, they're not. And the, the, the reality of it is that our youth do the right thing more than they don't. They make good decisions more than they don't. Don't get me wrong. We have issues. We have issues of youth that are using. We have use, issues of youth that are overdosing. And unfortunately, we have issues with youth that are dying because of all this. But when I ask eighth graders, what percentage of your classmates drank alcohol at least once last month, they tell me that, and this is anecdotal, about 80%. Think about that. If, if I think 80% of my classmates are doing something, would it make sense that I am more likely to give it a shot when I have the opportunity? And I will say the opportunity will come. The opportunity to use is going to happen again and again and again. Ultimately, it's up to that, that youth's it's, it's that use decision. So I want to make sure that they understand that most don't do this. Most don't. If you don't use, you are the majority. You're the norm. And so it, it's one of the main messages I like to give people. Again, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to trivialize or diminish the issues we have because we really do. And all those numbers that Naomi gave, man, they're scary. They're really scary and justifiably so. But take a look at this black bar here. The question here is, have you been so sad for two consecutive weeks, at least one time in the last year where it's affected how you live your life? 20% of our sixth graders said yes to that and over a third of our juniors, yet most don't use. So the answer to that question is 96%. It's worth noting because if your students, if your kids, uh, anybody in your life says everybody's doing this. No, they're not. So I just want to make that distinction. What to look for. Um, Naomi talked about um, overdosing and everything. And, and when, when parents ask me, what do I look for? How do I know my kids using? One of the first things I say is, do you notice a change? Do you notice a change? But do you also remember being an adolescent? You know, there are hormonal changes. There are all sorts of life changes going on during adolescence that could mimic a, a, a lot of these things. So much depends on the relationship you have with that individual. If there's changes in moods along with behavior and changes in appearance and, and things like that, they're worth a question. It doesn't always mean that there's substance use. But is it worth the question, especially if you know this person well and you do notice a big change? Ask about it. You know, we, we talk about red eyes and watery eyes. And if, if you notice all of a sudden somebody is carrying Visine around with them all the time, does that represent a change? Why do you have Visine? You know, what's up with that? But again, so much depends on this relationship you have with that person. Um, what used to matter doesn't anymore. What used to matter doesn't. Lost interest in activities they once thoroughly enjoyed. But again, this could be part of adolescence. Sometimes people grow up and they don't like the, the same things they, they used to. You remember the song, remember Puff the Magic Dragon? That was always the saddest song to me because um, he, he eventually outgrew Puff. And it was kind of sad, but it happens. But losing interest in something that they truly used to love but then don't anymore, is it worth a question? Change in friends. And, you know, again, it could be normal adolescence. It does not always mean drug use, but is it worth a question? A drop in performance, missing school, sleeping in class. Um, hey, I spend a lot of time in high schools and at 7.40 a.m., there's some people in there that are sleeping. I get that. Um, and frankly, I don't look to see if their eyes are constricted or, or anything's, anything like that. But if it represents a change and if, if your instincts, if your spidey sense says, that's weird, he never sleeps in class. And all of a sudden now he's sleeping in class is it worth a conversation. You know, we, we talk about changes in clothing and things like that, but a lot of individuals don't think about, there's a lot of drug references in the clothing um, that some people wear. 
And, um, you know, we, we know about 420, for example, right? And, but do we know about, have you ever seen a shirt that says 40 to 5? 40 minutes till 5 o'clock, 40 to 5. What time is that? That's 420. Have you seen, like, when we talk about butane hash oil? And, you, and so you'll see on a shirt, maybe the, the number 710, when you turn those upside down, oil. So the reason I'm mentioning this stuff is because when an individual, and these aren't allowed in school, but some of these things are so hidden um, and they're only known to the individuals within that culture, um, what it does is if you're wearing those clothes, it's kind of an advertisement. So the individuals that may be selling those pills, the individuals that might have access to other substances, they very well might approach that person thinking you're part of my culture and you're safe to approach. So I'm gonna ask you if you want some. I mentioned eye drops, mouthwash, perfumes to mask use. And I'm not talking about, you know, the, the people that douse themselves in ax because, you know, it smells really good, right? Um, again, part of adolescence. If you notice changes, ask about them and trust your instincts. So it's one of the questions we get all the time. What do I look for? How do I know? Certainly if you see paraphernalia, right? Then you do what you need to do. Know what your school policies are. Know what you can do under certain circumstances. Who can I talk to? Who can I address? Who can I approach? What can I say? What am I allowed to do? And how do I do this? If it's discussed as a staff, it really helps that you know ahead of time. So we've heard a lot of the nastiness about substance use, yet why do people use? They still use, why? I'm assuming you are no different than every group we talk to. We know, we have people in our lives that have substance abuse issues. Tell me where the logic is in it. There is no logic. We talk about signs and symptoms. What used to matter doesn't. Despite all the problems it causes, I still do it. Where's the logic in that? There is none. But what do we try to do as parents, as teachers, as administrators, as friends, as aunts and uncles, as partners? We try to apply logic to very illogical situations. But the thing is, the individual that is might be um, experiencing a use disorder their perception is different than ours their perception is different they don't see what we see don't assume they do so oftentimes what we do is we start pointing out strengths so I, we, we talk about this on when we talk about suicide prevention we start pointing out strengths and why people shouldn't use and things like that they may not look at it that way I don't use to get high. I use to get through my day. I use to function. Naomi talked about polysubstance use. If I use to get up, so I might take something like meth. Meth has been around for years. Meth has been around to help pilots in World War II stay awake so they could do what they do a lot longer. But then there's a little switch made chemically and all of a sudden we have methamphetamine. So I use that to get up to feel good. I'm talkative, I like myself. And then maybe I'll use an opioid to come down because I haven't slept in three days. Where's the logic in this? There is none. So we can point out all these downsides of substance use. But at some point, we need, to we, we need to think about why are these youth starting in the first place? Why? The answer can, from a very fundamental standpoint, is I do it to feel different or to feel better, but I do it because it makes my rotten life better. I don't plan on being an addict. I'm not going to be an addict. Well, how many people with a, that develop a use disorder say the same thing? Nobody plans on this. Nobody does. We have a system in place that can deal with individuals that, that fall off this proverbial cliff into the water. We have a system in place that can pull people out of the water. We can treat them. We can help them kick a habit. 
It's not easy to do. As a matter of fact, if you have someone in your life that's in recovery, you give them a big old socially distanced messed up hug because it, it, it is not easy to do. We have a system that can address it once they fall off that cliff. But at some point, we got to figure out how do we build a fence around that cliff? Our youth aren't doing it to be punks and to be addicts. They're doing it because the perception is it makes my rotten life better. So we talk a lot about resilience. Life hurts sometimes, as we all know. Resilience, that, that ability to bounce back when, when, when stuff changes. COVID has been a perfect example. You know, we all deal with stress and anxiety to different degrees because every one of our life paths is different. It's all different from one another. Your perception is different than mine. And it all depends on how you grew up, what you were taught, the experiences you've had and so forth. That's your life path. When we talk about resilience and when we talk about our youth, we talk about risk and protective factors, right? We, we wanna minimize those risk factors within that youth's life. We wanna maximize those pr protective factors. As administrators, as educators, as teachers, as individuals that have this contact and these relationships with youth, you have any idea how profound that is? Having connection to school, for one thing, is a tremendous risk factor. I mean, protective factor, excuse me. Connection to community, a big protective factor. But it's, it comes down to adults, adult influence in that individual's life. What a protective factor. Every time I go to a school, I, I talk about, I give resources. I just can't make anybody access them. Some of the best resources I tell the students every time are right here at that particular school. Not just counselors and psychologists, but teachers, coaches. You, you have so many advocates within that school. And sometimes, sometimes how to, uh, the catalyst to recovery or the catalyst to stop negative behavior can start with a positive relationship with an adult. And you have that unique opportunity oftentimes with these wonderful kids. Like I said, none of these little dudes start out to be addicts, none of them. They do it because it makes my rotten life better. So if we can enhance resilience through positive connection with these youth, wonderful. Don't ever underestimate the, the significance that we have, that you have in a young person's life. We have resources. And as I mentioned, I just can't make anybody access them. In a school, you have these resources, but you have other ones as well. Are you able, for example, to do a warm handoff? If a student was to come talk to a teacher, I got a problem. Can that teacher walk that student down to a counselor? Are, are there protocols? And what are they? Know what they are. Um, I also encourage in every single one of you to take some of these numbers, such as the Washington County Crisis Line, and put them in your phone. Make them one of your contacts. If you're talking to someone that's struggling wouldn't it be nice to have a 24 seven resource? What if you don't know what, what, what it, it's not just professionally, but personally, someone in your life, you're talking to someone that's struggling. You're not sure what to say, what to do. You have a 24 seven resource at your fingertips. What if you're struggling and you're not sure what to do? You have a 24 seven resource at your fingertips. My whole thing is I don't want the process to start. But once the process of a use disorder has begun, then I can turn people onto resources. I just can't make them go to them. I would rather it never start. As a matter of fact, while I'm, while I'm seeing this here, I didn't mention this and I put that graph up there. There was a, if you notice that green bar was higher than all the rest, 
Did you know our youth are gambling more than they're drinking, than they're binge drinking, than they're misusing prescription drugs or ingesting THC? We don't have a problem with gambling. I don't have a problem with it. I got a problem with the problem. But if I do this to cope, that's an issue. It's no different from that of a substance in many ways. We have treatment here in Oregon that's free of charge, all the way from treatment over the phone, all the way to residential treatment, and it's free. Again, I can't make anybody access it. So with that said, um, we have time for questions. And let me pu uh, apologize publicly to Naomi. <laughs> I, I learned that when I tried to answer a couple of those chats and that's when I was advancing your slides. <laughs> and so it scared me to death. And so I was inactive the rest of the way and I didn't, I didn't answer any more chats. I don't know why it did it, but I apologize for that. No problem at all, Andy. Uh, I did have a chance to look uh, through the chat, but Leslie also let me know if I miss anything. Um, I just wanted to go back. There was a question about um, uh, why, again, uh, people would add fentanyl if it kills people. And um, I, I think it is a really fair question. I think it really comes down to um, more people will start and continue to use uh, with very little um, uh, cost to somebody who is uh, giving out these pills um, versus the loss that they have. And so I don't know if it's fair to say that they don't care that this is impacting people in that way, um, but they're making a lot of money by adding just a little bit of fentanyl. Um, another question uh, was why doctors give so many prescriptions. And um, again, it goes back to doctors really just didn't want people to be in pain. And so they thought, oh, if this doesn't hurt anyone, I'm gonna make sure you have enough for a long time. Um, and unfortunately, we even know that, I think uh, Andy had mentioned this earlier, I think it's about after three to seven days, um, opioids don't really help with pain anymore anyway. Um, but we didn't know that at this time. So doctors really were just trying to keep people from hurting. Um, and unfortunately, it, it caused more addiction. Um, I can feel on that a little bit, Naomi. Yes, please okay. do. You know, and Naomi showed that graph. And if you remember back in 1999, 2000, the, uh, the, they did, doctors really treated to the pain. You remember being asked on a scale of one to 10, what's your pain? And so as a doctor, I mitigate pain. That's part of what I do. And they were, I mean, the, the information on opioids, it's not addictive. It's, it, it, there's no downside. It, it really helps with this. And so you know, as a result, after a while, you can go to a dentist and get a crown and get 30 Vicodin. Now you may use one and then have 29 sitting in your house. And when this epidemic started, uh, the, our educational messaging was lock up, lock up your pills because where our youth were getting these most of the time, we're at home. And then they were going to a friend's house or a relative's house, such as grandma, grandpa, and so forth because I had 29 Vicodin and they were going for a dollar a milligram out on the street. And so what happened is prescription uh, became a lot less. Doctors are prescribing a lot less than they used to. People started locking up their pills so it became harder to get. And so when I would ask youth, how, many, how easy is it for you to find heroin? I'm telling you again, this is anecdotal, 25% of them knew where they can find heroin because it was cheaper and it was easier to get in a lot of ways. Absolutely, thank you, Andy. Well, Andy, do you mind moving the slide back to the resources? We've had a couple of questions about just wanting to check back on some of those resources, thanks. Um, and actually, if you're not familiar, Washington County was actually the first county in the state of Oregon to pass a drug take back mandate to have pharmacy, or sorry, pharmaceutical companies pay for um, drug take back uh, programs. And this summer that will be statewide. So soon <laughs> we hope to see in um, every pharmacy across the county, if we can, um, more availability to take in uh, your medication, if you can, to um, one of these locations so that it is not so available. Um, and if you want more information, you can go to our Washington County website, but we do uh, wanna make note that please don't flush them down the toilet. <laughs> um, the best way is really to bring them into one of these drop sites. Can I throw out a question to y'all? Um, mm -hmm. We've had our law enforcement partners talking a lot about handling pills um, because of the just how dangerous it is to touch this substance. Can y'all speak to that a little bit? 
Sure. Um, I, I mentioned that fentanyl can be prescribed as a transdermal um, application, a patch. So if you touch these pills, um, it, it can be absorbed through the skin. Again, you don't know, or we don't know what's in this pills. The amount of fentanyl, even within the same batch could vary from pill to pill. The thing is, we don't know how much is in there. We don't know. So it can be, um, it, it, it can be absorbed through the skin. So even touching them can be quite dangerous. Absolutely. Even our medical examiners are taking very high precautions because of that. Um, and even our ways of testing, you may have heard of fentanyl test strips. Um, we also have lasers which are able to see and identify fentanyl. But if you imagine that's so little of a drug to find in a pill, um, it's easy to miss it with these testing uh, mechanisms. So it's better to be cautious and wear gloves um, and protect yourself. There was actually, also, oh, go ahead. Sorry, actually, you just you just spread another question that I had. I, I actually have fielded some, some questions in the last week or two about like, should the school district supply those testing strips as a harm reduction method? But it's really interesting that you just said that they are not necessarily foolproof. So I wonder, um, if that's a good idea, because it sounds like maybe it isn't. If it gives if it gives students a false sense of hope or or security that the pill that they're taking is the right is what they want it to be. That's a really great question. Um, you know, before when it was maybe more common to know that within a batch it was going to be similar, um, maybe that would be the case. Uh, but oftentimes. Um, that will, that really just isn't a commonality anymore. And best practice is to actually to crush an entire pill and then to dilute it in water. And it's really just a piece of paper that you're dipping in it. Um, but if you don't have an entire pill and if the next pill is gonna have a completely different amount, unfortunately it's not super helpful, it would be better to distribute that. But really the safest thing we can recommend is um, naloxone. I would also suggest too that look, if, if uh, from a very fundamental standpoint, if they didn't get the pill from a prescription, um, assume it does have fentanyl in it. Mm -hmm. Assume Absolutely. it, because as we said before, about a hundred percent, a hundred percent of the pills confiscated were counterfeit, and they're not made in a lab. They're not made for prescription distribution. They are made in somebody's garage or whatever, and we don't know what's in them. But that fentanyl that gives you a pretty good high with very little, so it's cheap, it doesn't, you know, people are overdosing. Um, and that's just a reality. So from a very basic standpoint, if it didn't come from a doctor, your doctor, mm -hmm. assume, assume that it has it in it. Absolutely. I mean, they do have fentanyl uh, strips also available at our public health van. So that is available. And, and that is run by HIV Alliance, who has a lot of experience with distribution um, uh, of naloxone and fentanyl. But it's also, they can run out. There's quite a big back order also on fentanyl test strips right now. So that's creating some issues. Um, I did see a question about uh, meth or methamphetamine. Someone asked uh, what that was. Um, it is a stimulant. Um, oftentimes, if you think about the um, prescription version, it would be Ritalin or Adderall, um, similar in kind of how, how it reacts um, in someone. It's just, again, it's whether it's um, man-made uh, versus um, in a, a lab that has uh, measured amounts um, of you know, safe impacts on somebody if they're gonna take it. Um, we also had some questions about just what drugs do, how, how people feel when they take them. There was actually a question about if some people feel energetic when taking opioids, and actually that, that can happen, um, but generally uh, an opioid high um, will be somebody who it looks very relaxed. Um, both opioids and uh, methamphetamines or stimulants generally have a euphoric uh, reaction. Uh, but I love how Andy had mentioned before, you know, it used to be that people thought, oh, people, you know, are, are doing this to feel great. Um, and a message that we really want to get out is, you know, maybe, um, but a lot of times people just want to feel okay. Um, they really just want to survive. They want to stay, um, you know, active and have energy, maybe with a stimulant like meth, um, or maybe with opioids, they're, they're anxious, they are scared, um, and they don't know what else to do to feel better. And so those are some common things to look for. Yeah, I would just echo that it, it's, it's 
pretty individual. It really is. I, I know when I've taken Vicodin after a surgery, it makes me feel sick. I don't like the way it makes me feel at all. And, um, you know, it's not the case for everybody. Um, so some people that get used to taking that from a surgery, from a, you know, doctor prescribed, I don't take it for pain, but you know, I just, I need to go to sleep and I need to sleep. So I take it to sleep. You know, it's pretty innocent how the process can begin. Um, it, it's just, we have to be aware of this stuff and take it as prescribed. It's prescribed and it's dosed for a reason. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a great point. You know, we just don't want to put anybody in a category. And Andy, there actually was a question in here talking about concern about assuming somebody may be using substances based off of their clothes. I don't know if you want to respond to that. It sounds kind of similar to this. Yeah, you know, there's the way people dress and what people wear, and what's on their clothing and things like that. As, as we all know, um, a lot of individuals out there doing different things. Don't assume that the way someone dress means they're part of this drug culture, not at all. Um, and so that's, I, it, if there's certain things that logos and stuff like that that are banned at schools, but certain logos that are on there, um, like I said, it, it, it can be a signal to those within the drug culture um, you know, that this person is also in the drug culture. So maybe they'll want to buy something um, and things like that. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure even what else to say about that. Dang it, I, I have some examples of, um, of shirts and things like that. So instead of it'll show Colonel Sanders, for example, instead of uh, KFC, it says THC and things like that. That's pretty obvious and it wouldn't be allowed in the school. The, um, the symbol for 40 to five, it's, it looks like a tree <laughs> and a lot of people wouldn't know what that meant, but to the people within that culture, it means 420. So if I need to sell some weed, if I want to sell some pills, maybe this person is the one to ask about that. Um, but don't make the assumption, you, you know, we wear, we wore stuff that our parents couldn't stand. My kids wear stuff that I would never wear. <laughs> You know, and I try really hard not to be the get off my lawn guy, um, but I find that the older I get, the more of the get off my lawn guy I'm, I'm becoming. Um, just don't make the assumption. We know that data tells us that most of our youth don't do this. Keep that in mind. Thank you, Andy. There's been some great uh, comments and it's really just, you know, it's just another sign, something to be aware of. And, and what I hear Andy talk about just multiple times with our community is it's really about just asking, you know, that is the most powerful thing that we have is just having a conversation and opening it up, um, you know, not attacking or assuming or getting them in trouble, just saying, hey, like, what does that mean? Um, Somebody mentioned something about bandana colors. Um, to my knowledge, I don't think color of bandanas is associated with drugs. Um, I know there's associations with some gangs and things like that at times, but again, not necessarily, right? So it's just being careful um, with uh, thinking about that. Um, you know, it kind of reminds me of one of the questions also that I saw in the chat about um, uh, catastrophizing. Somebody asked to kind of restate um, the language that we should not use with youth. Um, and Andy has some great uh, feedback, so I'll let him talk a little bit about just messaging. Um, but I think with the catastrophizing comment, it's just, you know, you don't want to say, oh my gosh, do you know that there's these drugs out here and they're killing everybody? You know, you don't want to die. You know, it's not these like scary messages that we want to get out there. We want to be pretty even keel. We want to be very factual. Um, you know, we don't want to say that you will always die because it'll be that one friend who takes a pill that looks like what is out there. There'll be fentanyl in it. They won't die. And now everybody thinks that's fake. So we, we really want to be upfront and knowledgeable about what's happening. Um, but we really don't want to just scare kids. We really want to give them the truth. And most importantly, we want to give them resources. You know, we want to help them feel better in different ways. Our youth get a bad reputation and a lot of times it's not deserved. Um, in my opinion, we tend to paint with a very broad brush and I hate that. We talk about our youth to do this, our youth to do that. Well, again, start from the, the, 
the facts of what you know. Most of our youth don't do this. Nobody plans on becoming addicted. Nobody plans on developing a youth disorder. And so our youth are, are smarter than many of us give them credit for. Do you have any idea how much these, these guys know? These, the, they know a lot. So when we talk about them, absolutely. Have a dialogue, not necessarily a monologue. As parents, don't do drugs. It'll kill you, right? And then what the, the next day, they have somebody in recovery that comes and tells them about what they went through for the sole purpose that I don't want you to go through this. But sometimes what that youth sees, they didn't die. They didn't die. I'm not going to die. I'm going to be fine. And I'm not going to let it get that bad. That beautiful brain we talked about that takes about 25 years to mature at this age, oftentimes they're basing a lot of decisions on, or uh, uh, some of the process of their decision-making is based on impulsivity, emotion, not necessarily reason, judgment, consequences. Again, I asked, do you remember being an adolescent? You know, how often did we think six years ahead, six weeks ahead? six hours ahead. We're right here and right now. It's not going to happen to me. And as Naomi put it, that wonderful, that, that confidence that so many of our youth have that it's not going to happen. It serves us well. But with that impulsivity, emotion and things like that, sometimes we can make one decision. Then we may not get busted. We may not die. We may not even get sick. But that one decision could affect the rest of our life. We just don't think of it that way, but that's the reality. So when we talk to our youth, they're, they're smarter than we often give them credit for. So in, in my opinion, it, it's okay to be honest. Absolutely. Andy, somebody also mentioned about uh, pill parties. Um, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, pill parties are, you know, um, when... They have a party and people are told to bring whatever you can find, whatever you can find in your house, you put them in a big bowl. And then at the pill party, you just reach into the bowl and you take whatever. Um, does anybody see a downside in that? <laughs> I mean, how, how frightening is that? I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know how often that happens, but I know it's happened. I don't know how regular th this is. Um, but it, it has happened. So again, I ask, where's the logic in this? When you're talking to your youth about, you, you know, um, they need to understand what's in some of these pills and they are meant for specific purposes and they do affect the body in specific ways. And when they're combined with other things, not only different pills, but things like alcohol and benzodiazepines and any, uh, antipsychotic agents and anti-anxiety pills and things like that, it, it can result in death. And, uh, it, you know, uh, again, I don't know, you might have stats on this, Naomi. I, I don't. I don't know how often that happens. I just know it has happened and it does happen certainly occasionally. Absolutely. And I think sometimes, you know, pill parties make it sound really planned. You know, I don't know that many teens that like to be that plant necessarily. Um, this could be as simple as hanging out at their friend's house, watching TV, and they reach in their pocket and say, hey, I found these, you know? So it, it really can be really informal. Um, but generally, again, pills are seen as not as scary, not as concerning, um, especially when they were prescribed. It's like, well, this was safe for someone, right? Um, and, and I wanna feel differently. I just wanna feel differently. So that's kind of where those are coming from. There was also a comment I saw about other resources for teens and someone mentioned the recovery high school. So I did wanna mention that here, there is a recovery high school. It's actually in Clackamas County, but it's available to any uh, youth in our uh, state. Um, I also wanna say that um, you don't have to be in recovery. I think there was a, a comment that if you're sober, um, Sharon is the, um, the, the principal at the school. She's fantastic. And she will take anybody wherever they are if it's a good fit for them. So this is really a wonderful youth supported um, program that is wrap around um, people who are very passionate um, in making sure that youth who are struggling um, can have a really positive uh, high school experience with their, um, 
youth around them. So uh, it's called Harmony High School if you're interested in looking at more information. Leslie, those are all I got. Did I miss anything? No, I don't think so. I think I think you did. I I just ask anybody else as we're wrapping up if there's if there's additional questions, y'all feel free to pop them in the chat um, so that we can make sure that we that we get to them. Hmm. I think that's probably a more me question. Uh, I work in a middle school, but I wonder if they have signs in bathrooms um, to raise awareness. I you know I think that is a a great idea, and we haven't done it yet, but I. I will write it down. And I think it's something that we, that we can work towards. Um, Naomi, can you tell us or, or Andy, tell us where we can get some materials um, if we did want some signage to post in some, some places around our buildings? Sure. So, I mean, uh, I was wondering about that, uh, of what kind of signage. So if it's resources, you know, I'm happy to pass along all of our resources. Uh, we did actually provide resources for the Beaverden School District website in response to opioids. So they're also on there if you look at the district website. Um, if it's in response to naloxone, the Tri-County area actually has those printed both in English and Spanish. We have offered it to many of the schools, um, but it's available to anyone. Um, a lot of these posters too, if you look it up for the Tri-County area, um, you can request through SAMHSA or NIDA um, and other programs that will just send it to you for free. So um, if, if there are some, you know, uh, pieces that you want or specific uh, things that you want posters about, definitely reach out to Andy or I, and I'm sure we can direct you. Um, Thank you. That's super helpful. I think the resource information and, you know, just that, that virtually 100% of pills that, that kids come in contact with are fake is such, is such a powerful fact that I, I think they don't get it. Um, Absolutely. So I'll, I'll, I'll be in touch about that. There is a poster that was recently designed. Um, it does say, don't be fooled. It is designed for anyone in the community. So it would be appropriate for youth. And Leslie, I will forward that to you after um, uh, today so that you can have access to it. And, and the campaign is don't be fooled uh, what you think it is, it's not. So it's a very simple message, but they are posters that are um, getting distributed across the Tri-County area and you're welcome to use it wherever you can. I think that's perfect. I think that that would be really helpful to our schools. Uh, one more question in the chat. Um, if we know of a parent who's using and they have elementary school age students who are in the home, what steps can we take to ensure safety for our littles and also getting the parent help? That's a fantastic question. Um, this is a really hard one, right? Um, and it's really hard to know depending on the substance. Is it use? Is it misuse? Is it harming their functioning? Which is really the question Andy mentioned earlier when we go see our doctor. Now it doesn't say how high is your pain? It says how well are you functioning? And that was actually a part of public health effort to shift that dialogue. Um, this is another one that is challenging as well. You know, um, as much as you can give resources, I think the better. Um, another parent perhaps uh, reaching out to them or somebody who has a relationship. There are a lot of supports, but there's a lot of huge fears for parents of reaching out for help about um, substance use disorders, fear of job loss, fear of their kids getting taken away. And so those are very real fears. And so I just really wanna bring that out. Um, in our state, if you reach out for treatment, um, you cannot lose your job. So I will put that out there. Um, that is very heavily protected. Um, but there are other really real consequences that could happen that are terrifying. Um, and one of those is losing your kids. And so um, I think with this, you know, a relationship passing on, you know, a way where they can connect maybe with some kind of um, services with treatment, which also are on our website. And I'm happy to send to Leslie later um, is maybe the first step. Thank you for that. I think it's I think it's a great answer, and it gets complicated, right? Because of the mandatory reporting, you know. I, I can I can totally see why parents would not want to be super forthcoming about their struggles with school staff um, around our just obligation to call child welfare when really we we do want to support them. So yeah, absolutely. All right. Any any additional ones? The chat went quiet, so I just want to make sure that we that we got it all. Okay, I, I just want to thank I want to thank you both for so much uh, for presenting uh, really helpful information. I um, our district has taken it really seriously and kind of come at it from all sides now. There's some conversations happening in buildings. I know that there's some advisory lessons happening to our students. There's some health lessons in certain schools happening to our students uh, that are being delivered to our students. Um, and I think it's just a conversation that that continues. So thank you both 
so much for being here. And again, thank you to the over a hundred people um, that opted in, right? That that showed up because I know that it is a very, very stressful time. Andy, you're, uh, I need you to do it. I need you to say the thing that you say about living at work and working at home and living. I can't yeah. even, I can't even say it. <laughs> but within our team, we're like, you know, what Andy says, uh, because people are, are just struggling in our system. So what is it? Can you give me the words? Yeah, yeah when we're talking about COVID-19, there's a, um, this isn't normal. And we, we do try to normalize this. You are not working from home. Um, you're at home during a crisis trying to work. Our students aren't going to school from home. You're at, go, you're, you're at home trying to go to school during a crisis. And there's a difference. And this has been a different time. And just the fact that all of you showed up is awesome. And I, I wanna point out too, and just make a little, I'm gonna plant a seed. Um, messaging within your school from your students is huge. Have, have, and you know, when we talk about creating posters and things like that, we can provide you with the data and the information, but have it created in, in their voices and have those up in the walls and things like that. It makes a difference. Um, you know, we come in, well, I come in and I give this stuff and it's like, yeah, yeah, okay, I've heard that. Naomi comes in, she's awesome. And, um, but hearing it from peers is, is good. So think about that. What a class project to develop some messaging that's from the youth. Absolutely. And it's a powerful voice. I mean, part of the reason our drug tape back uh, policy got passed was because a youth organization within one of the schools in Washington County came forward and gave testimony. So it's, it's powerful. And we have amazing, uh, amazing leadership kids, right? Like we have amazing organized kids really trying to make a difference around mental health and, and all kinds of issues that are, that our kids are struggling with. So I, leveraging, leveraging the, the youth in our system, I think that's huge. So thanks for that. And yes, Andy, we have trademarked your living at working living. We've trade, we, we give you credit every time. And I know most of our staff are in some capacity back to their buildings, but it is still just a crazy time. Um, yeah. Yes. Don't, and Andy don't be surprised to see t-shirts here pretty soon. <laughs> I think I can tell you, I stole that from somewhere. I don't know. So if you get calls from, you know, some lawyers. <laughs> Andy Cartmill, well, all the way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I completely stole that too, because I it's so true, you know, it's so true. It is so true. So thank you, everyone. Uh, you take, take great care of yourselves. And thanks again for being here. Uh, if you have any follow up questions, uh, feel free, you can, you can send them my way. Again, my name is Leslie Rogers, find me on email, and I will do my best to respond and meet your needs. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We can stop the recording.